Muito bem. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Fátima Carneiro. Uh, she is a very well-known researcher and clinician. Actually, she is a full professor of medical faculty at the University of Porto. She's currently the, the head of the Department of uh, Pathology at the Centro Hospitalar San João. And she's also a senior researcher of the Patimu by 3S. And uh, as you know, when taking the, all the CV very, very concentrated, she is a author of more than 400 papers and with an age index of uh, 70. So in, on behalf of the uh, Institute, I would like to, to thank Professor Fatima for accepting this uh, invitation and to, to share with us um, your experience in, 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 in research with a topic that you will present to today, hereditary diffuse gastric cancer syndrome from the genes to pathology and implications for diagnosis and treatment. Please, Professor Fatima Carneiro, the, um, you can start. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'll, I'll just thank for the invitation and uh, we'll address immediately the topic, apologizing for this delay that was due to a problem with the connection. It was not my fault, at least, which is already good enough. So I was asked to provide, to make a suggestion, and the title, uh, it was the one I selected because it's one of the topics I dedicate myself the most recently. So what we will address today is hereditary diffuse gastric cancer syndrome and trying to go from genes to pathology implications for diagnosis and treatment. Why genes? Because this is an hereditary disease, so it's genetically determined. And there are genuine mutations that we will approach. Now it doesn't want to move. Okay, it did. Okay, so uh, having the context in mind, because otherwise it's not so clear, we know that regarding gastric cancer, 90% of the cases are sporadic. Any of us can suffer from in this country with high prevalence and not uh, so good screening methods, not to say no screening, no official screening at all, or organized. And 10% of the cases are familial. It means that there are gastric cancer in families. And within these familial cases, some of them, a small percentage is hereditary. I, I hope that's clear for everybody. When we talk about familial, it means that in the same family, we may have more than one case of gastric cancer. And when we talk about hereditary, this is true, but the genetic cause is known. While for the familial case, it can be the easy play between environment, diet, and other things, H. pylori infection, and genetic susceptibility. I'll come to this immediately. So what we are talking about is in the cases that are familial, out of those 10%, 7 to 9 are familial only. The major role is played by environmental factors, H. pylori, inducing smart mutations in the gastric mucosa. And this is modulated by genes of low penetrance. Just to give you an idea, for instance, the genes that code for uh, inflammatory mediators, depending on the intensity of the inflammation, you can have atrophy and changes in the gastric mucosa that can be absent in other individuals in the same environment. So this is why we have aggregation in some families and not in others. When we talk about the hereditary, as I mentioned before, we are now talking about cases in which in one family, there is a determinant mutation germline that uh, carries high risk because it is highly penetrant and carries a high penetrant genetic susceptibility. Of course, there are environmental factors that can modulate the progression of the disease. And altogether, you have two settings that are completely different because the approaches dealing with the patients are different also. And which symptoms do we have in the stomach? The one I promised to talk today about is hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. That is just one among three major syndromes. In this one, what we have is a gastric cancer composed by cells like the ones I'm showing, 
which do not aggregate because they have a deficient in adhesion, in cell adhesion. And these cells are constituted, uh, they have a abundant cytoplasm and the nucleus that is localized at the periphery. And the name they got in the literature from many years ago is signet ring cell. This is the famous, these are the famous signet ring cells. And this type of very diffuse acid acid is the type of cells we find in. There are the types of hereditary, and I emphasize hereditary gastric cancer. The one most recently described is this GAP syndrome. It's completely different. Here you have polyps, and the gene is APC gene and a very specific localization. We do not have time to address this at all. There is still another hereditary gastric cancer syndrome that is designated intestinal type. And for this is even more complex because the exact genetic cause is not known. Maybe several genes are implicated, but it's not clarified for the moment. So we'll focus on hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. <clears throat> Sorry, I've been talking since 9 a.m. today. So the first thing is which are the germline defects behind the syndrome? And the germline defects were identified quite a number of years ago when in Maori kingdoms from New Zealand, families with various generations were identified in which individuals were affected at young age, as this one, 21 years, by gastric cancer and were even dying of the disease, this one at the age of 17. In many generations, the phenotype of gastric cancer was expressed. So it was clear that this was a genetically determined situation. The, the researchers behind, and Perry Guilford was the main one, were clear by that time, if you want to understand the uh, disease that is cancer, before searching for the genes, please look at pathology. And that's what they have done. And they have seen that in this family, the affected individuals from which there was material, the gastric cancer was of diffuse type with signet ring cells. By that time, this was 1998, it was already known that CDH1 gene encoding for ECAD ring was involved in sporadic diffuse gastric cancer. So Perry Guilford, the person I have the privilege to, to know, focused as he is, he began searching in obligatory carriers of the disease who were alive for germline mutations of CDH1 gene. And he managed to demonstrate that there was a linkage between the phenotype of gastric cancer and the presence of germline mutation CDH1 gene. This is the way it was identified there with the diffuse gastric cancer for the first time. And this was 1998, as I said, and was published in Nature by that time. Since then, I had the huge privilege to participate in the group that was constituted as International Gastric Cancer Linkage Consortium that uh, has been carrying for years studies in aiming at a better characterization of the syndrome. So it was, for instance, possible to identify that besides point mutation, the gene can suffer large deletions, as the one pointed here, meaning that a new mechanism besides the mutations, the large deletions, is also a genetic cause of hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. So in a family in which there is a clinical suspicion of hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, if the genetic test is negative for mutations in CDH1, that uh, blood should also be screened for large lesions because it's mandatory. So what are we talking about? We are talking about CDH1 gene and coding ecadrine, as I said. Ecadrine is the cell adhesion molecule we have here a membrane, the cell membrane, there another one. There is an intracellular component and an extracellular component. And the linkage between the extracellular components keep the cells side by side. And the intracytoplasmic domain of the protein, there is a linkage with other proteins of this addition complex, such as the tannins. I want to address your attention to this issue because I'll come to this later. 
So CDH1, it can be is fundamental for the cell vision, for maintaining the epithelial architecture, integrity and clarity, and prevent cells from moving and invading. What happens when there is loss of, cell, of function? So CDH1 is this molecule, this uh, glycoprotein at the cell membrane, and the function is the one I described. When there is uh, one inactivating mutation and there is loss of function of ek and I want to emphasize that CDH1 is a tumor suppressor gene, so for the inactivation, you need two events. One is the germline mutation. This is not enough to create a phenotype because this uh, tumor suppressor, you have to inactivate the other gene. And this second gene is then inactivated by promoter methylation by LOH or another mutation. And when you inactivate the two alleles of the same gene, there is loss of function that destroys cell cell addition. So the cells do not appear any longer. They lose the organization and polarity and they become mobile and invade the tissues. So as you understand, there is this invasion of the cell, the basement membrane, and we are talking now about cancer. And it requires the inhibition, the inactivation of the two alleles of the gene. But we have another problem, and this is that we can have germline variants that are not pathogenic. And some of you may be aware of the fact that currently, it is possible to classify the germline mutations in several categories. And with clinical impact should only be taken in consideration those that are clearly pathogenic or likely pathogenic. So an individual or a family can carry an alteration of CDH1 gene that is not being demonstrated to be pathogenic and can be classified as likely benign or benign, or even of uncertain significance. You may know from literature that there are groups of people specialized in the curation of the mutations in several genes, and that is the case for the CDH1 gene. And only the pathogenic or likely pathogenic mutations are actionable. And we should be aware, and I'm simplifying very much the message because we do not have much time for it, we should be aware what the disease spectrum is. I can imagine that by now you realize that part of the disease spectrum, the clinical spectrum, is gastric cancer. This was acknowledged by the first time by WHO in the publication of this book that was in 2020. It was that new that he got position at the front page cover of the book. And here is the description of the main lesions that I will detail briefly. What I want to emphasize for the moment is that in a family, you can have patients who are those who brought the attention of the clinicians and the family to the situation who have advanced cancer, but carriers can be completely symptomatic. Despite that, they can have in their stomachs dozens of tiny foci of diffuse gastric cancer that are restricted to epithelial lesions, as the one I'm showing, or invade only the superficial area of the lamina propria. These are the individuals you should target. These are the individuals who should be protected. And I'll detail why. And now we have the second publication of the same book now in 2019 and again. Because of the relevance of the issue, you have eric diffuse calcium cancer at the front cover. You have the stomach with several foci of intermucosal lesions as this one, and you have the demonstration of the large lesions of the gene that I described before. This is one of our publications on the issue in which you can see, you can see here clearly not only repeating that we can have tiny foci that are hardly detected even by endoscopy, in which you can have either superficial invasive gastric cancer or intraepithelial, for which we described for the first time this fastoid spread of spring, uh, signet ring cells or even in situ carcinoma. Both genders develop recurrently and multifocal, as I'm showing, diffuse type of gastric cancer. 
I'm showing you another view of these lesions. This is intermucosal invasion, this is huge protein at the cells. And this is the intraepithelial with the features of parasitoid spread of signet ring cells. So we know very well the morphology. We know very well the morphology of early lesions. Unfortunately, we know also the morphology of advanced lesions. Now it's not a carrier, a symptomatic carrier. This is a patient suffering from this type of gastric cancer, leading to the thickness of the gastric core to an aspect that is described in literature by Limitis plastica, which is due to the invasion of low thickness by those cells that do not longer look like signet ring cells, but they become much more atypical, as I'll show you. In this widely invasive grassy phenotype with Limitis plastica appearance at microscopy, usually those neoplastic cells are no longer beautiful signet ring cells, but now they are bizarre, without cohesion, with hyperchromacy, multinucleation, so on and so forth. So very aggressive. And what is even more intriguing is that we can have in the same family as the one I'm showing you, that is a Portuguese family, some individuals with indolent early gastric cancer and others with very aggressive advanced gastric cancer. The feature of signet ring cells are lost and in the advanced aggressive stage, the neoplastic cells, they become proliferative with PI67 and expression of PT53 besides other markers. So we have heterogenic in this gastric cancer between families, also between individuals of the same family. This is one of those families we recently had the opportunity to study here at the Hospital Saint Joao. The proband was this individual, 18 years old, so uh, an adolescent with gastric cancer that was a terrifying neoplasia. The first endoscopy is what I'm showing to you. It had been symptomatic for until two weeks before the, the day he, he came to the hospital and he died in one month. So it can be extremely aggressive in some patients when it's not early detected. That's why for those who are carriers and do not have the phenotype of a clinical evident gastric cancer, they should be submitted to protective measures, namely prophylactic hysterectomy, which means removing the stomach of the carriers, even if no lesions are seen by microscopy, because by histology, most of the case will show them. In this family, one of the individuals who was carrying was one of the sisters of the problem, 14 years old. And the pressure over this family was so heavy that they managed to get the loans from the ethic committee to have this patient submit to prophylactic hysterectomy, usually it's performed only after 20 years old. So putting everything together, this is a model that we published in 2004 in which we describe a normal stomach in a carrier who can have the germline mutation, a single allele affected. When the second allele is inactivating the stomach, you have the intertelial lesions when additional somatic events are added to the previous alterations. You have now invasion of the lamina propria that can go all thickness and invade the all thickness of the stomach. So the phenotype at the early stage is that the tumors are in the lamina propria, the cells, they have indolent phenotype, they are non-proliferative when other mutations now, somatic mutations, and what we have is an aggressive phenotype with pleomorphic and the signet ring cells are no longer seen and these tumors are proliferative with PI67 expression and P53 positivity, most probably mutant. So having said this about gastric cancer, are there other features in the clinical phenotype? Yes, there is. And one of the organs that is affecting this syndrome is the breast. And in the breast, the females, they develop recurrently again, and specifically multifocal types of, of breast cancer that have a very specific phenotype. And this phenotype is the so-called lobular breast cancer. We can say that lobular breast cancer is the counterpart in the breast of the diffused gastric cancer in the stomach. 
and these patients can be affected on unilateral or bilateral. And this is uh, something that should be systematic research. Another clinical phenotype is the occurrence of cleft lip to palate that has been described in several families. One of these families was coming from Brazil, I guess Anmar is aware of, and was studied by a study coming from Brazil, now famous in the study of uh, the, this thing who is Rashid. And this is uh, one of the publications in which you can have cleft lip and palate, and you can have some defects in addition in the midline, the skin of the midline. So in the disease spectrum, as a summary, you can have diffuse calcium cancer, multifocal, CDH1, uh, uh, ECAD ring is involved. You can have breast cancer, and you can have cleft lip palate here, just the lip, the cleft lip here, you can have affecting also the palate. And all of a sudden, I'm showing you something in which there is the name of another gene. So it means that only gastric cancer can be caused, so far we know at the moment, by another gene besides CDH1. And that is really what I'm going to talk about very briefly. This was identified for the first time in Netherlands in families with many members, several of them having died of gastric cancer and for which it was screened for the mutation of e ring gene that were, and mutations were not found. And finally, it was possible to identify mutations in this gene, CTNNA1, that encodes for alpha catenin. I showed before that alpha catenin is a molecule to which e ring links in the cytoplasm, both neuron to addition system of the cells. So either one or the other, if there is a germline mutation, will affect the structure of the protein and will have a functional impact in the vision of the cells. They look very much the same, these gassy cancers in the setting of mutations of CTNNA1. As with the cadring gene, we have signature in cell phenotype and there is loss of expression of alpha catenin now. So the drivers of these mutations, they have also multifocal diffuse type gastric cancer. It is not a very deeply study field so far because the identification of this gene was quite recently. And you have there 2019, one of the last publications regarding the issue. And as I promised, we have to know now which are the clinical implications of this diagnosis regarding surveillance and prophylaxis. And the first thing is that we should be aware of the consequences. So we should identify to make all efforts to identify the CDH1 asymptomatic carriers. Because for those, pre-symptomatic testing should be offered and uh, should be identified the predisposing variant because it's only having these elements in hands that you can have uh, pragmatic actions regarding disease prevention. So what, what we want to emphasize with this is necessary to identify the carriers of the germline mutations behind the developing of cancer. And this is one of the case to stop the developing of aggressive stages of this disease. How can we do? We can provide intensive gastric surveillance to the carriers, to the asymptomatic carriers. We can provide intensive breast surveillance to the same individuals. And we can provide risk reduction surgery. What I was talking before as prophylactic mastectomy or even mastectomy. And the, the, the issue is how to identify those individuals. So we need genetic criteria for testing these individuals in one family. This is a beautiful picture that was taken in 2019 in Wanaka in the Netherlands, in which the members of the International Gastric Cancer Linkage Consortium met for the last time. You know, this uh, some people here, this is Perry Guilford, who is the one who described this signal for the first time in New Zealand. I'm sitting there on the floor with the baby. I'm, I'm liking this because this baby is not my baby. 
this is this baby was the daughter of this woman and this woman is not a medical doctor is a family member so in these meetings then in which many people from all the world participated also a maori family was attending every session this is another of their family and everybody even the baby was there so why am i lighting this because first because it was a fantastic meeting and second because it was there that the most recent guidelines were prepared published in lancet and college in 2020 before other guidelines had been previous published and updated 1999 the first 2010 the second 2015 the third and now 2020 the last version and there you can find the criteria of course i'm not going to describe just why so like that there are family criteria and when this criteria is in one family individuals should be targeted for genetic screening for the proposed surveillance mechanisms and there are individual criteria and this changed along the years and currently for instance a diffuse calcic cancer diagnosed in individual younger than 50 years is by itself a criterion for genetic testing. Several others, being diffuse calcic cancer in the Maori family is by itself, having diffuse calcic cancer and cleft polyp or cleft palate by itself, even criteria from pathologists such as these signet ring cells or pashtite cells. Uh, spread of signature cells in individuals younger than 50 can be taken as a criteria for genetic testing. So this means again that the approach to hereditary diffuse calcic cancer, as for many other types of cancer, should be, multi, should be multidisciplinary. And as I said before, CDH1 is the first target. If negative, CT and NA1 should be tested mandatorily. So what we have these days is uh, uh, the guidelines just guiding people about what should be done in face of one family in which there is suspicion of hereditary diffuse calcic cancer or in face of one individual. So of course I'm not going to describe you this, just why lie that the genetic testing criteria should be taken in consideration for the search of these two genes. And if this is, part, this is positive, the mutation, then there are pathogenic variants. And it is diffuse calcic cancer. We have hereditary diffuse calcic cancer. As I said, the phenotype, we have gastric and breast cancer. And for a while, some families express only breast cancer. Now it's accepted to designate these families as hereditary lobular breast cancer. As I mentioned, we have to protect these carriers, and it is recommended for hereditary diffuse calcic cancer to offer prophylactic total gastrectomy and to also to take, take attention to all the family members and to go ahead with all the procedures. Namely, when a family member refuses to be submitted to prophylactic gastrectomy, should be considered the possibility of intensive uh, screening by endoscopy. For hereditary uh, lobular breast cancer, besides the annual gastric, uh, gastric surveillance, because sooner or later these individuals can develop gastric cancer and they will move from this label to that one. And uh, total gastrectomy should be considered if a biopsy is positive. And if that is positive, it should even be considered total, total prophylactic assessment. And of course, we have annual breast surveillance considering risk reducing mastectomy with or without reconstruction, it depends. So everything is detailed. And it is very important, some of you will ask, I'm afraid, that we have the clinical syndrome, but the genetic testing is negative for CDH1, genetic test is negative for the gene encoding for alpha catenin. There is a family history, there are some patients affect. What am I going to do to the carriers of those in those families? And for the moment, it's not advised to perform prophylactic total gastrectomy in non-affected individuals. 
and the affected individuals, of course, what they will have is uh, totally affected with, with curative intention. It's difficult to deal with this, but that is life, and these are the rules at the moment. And thank you so much for your attention. Ready for your questions. And I apologize again for the delay at the beginning. I think I took the 30 minutes, <laughs> but the 30 minutes were actually. It was perfect, Professor Fatima. Thanks for this excellent I talk and the, <laughs> and the example that it's possible to do basic research with real impact, clinical impact. So um, if you agree, we have some time to, to questions. And if you don't mind, I will open to, to this discussion now. Please. OK. Tiago? Hi, uh, Professor, P Professor Fatima. Uh, thank you so much for, the, for, your, um, for your talk. I remember that I, I also saw your talk when I was a medical student a few <laughs> years ago, a couple of years ago. And uh, it's, it's really great that uh, you know, myself as a physician scientist and uh, I also practice medicine and to see that it's actually possible to do groundbreaking research based on the clinical practice and also doing uh, uh, really feeding uh, uh, basic research based on that. And uh, I was uh, thinking based on your studies and on your family studies, and this is probably a, mech a mechanism of trying to search for other mechanisms within uh, understanding a mutation. So within uh, CDH1 uh, mutant families, uh, 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 from what I understood, not all of them have 100% uh, uh, penetrance to have the, uh, the, the different phenotypes. And uh, uh, by having these big consortiums and with all these, these data, uh, uh, can you assemble enough uh, uh, subjects with a mutation to, uh, to study which other genetic factors predispose to either uh, have the, in this case, let's imagine uh, gastric cancer or not to have. So either predisposing or protective factors. Uh, uh, have you done anything on that? And uh, do you have any clues? Uh, well, you cannot imagine how deep the research is in these fields of course. regarding the genetic characterization. And besides the new gene, alpha catenin encoding gene, several other genes have been pointed as candidates. And uh, uh, as you can imagine, there are many people working, so there are central databases in which people try to address issues that you are raising have not been very uh, fruitful, the results so far. Of course, we know what I summarized, and that is already a lot. It's difficult to understand why, for instance, in the Portuguese family, we have one 18-year-old eight boy dying of the disease while all the other family members are alive without stomachs but alive. So we don't know exactly what turns it completely crazy. From our studies, what we demonstrated now in the tissues is that you have activation of epithelial mesenchymal transition, and you have the activations of the genes behind, named stat 3 p -SARC, and you have the expression of uh, genes, proteins that are linked to aggressive behavior, such as proliferation and activation of the p53. This is the phenotype that in the tissues you have seen more than the genetic associations of other genes that will determine a different phenotype. This is now clear in the stomach, not so clear in the breast, but in the breast, the phenotype is more or less stable. In the stomach, it's clear. There is an indolent and an aggressive. And for the indolent phenotype, yeah, believe it or not, you can have individuals with tiny foci they, that remain for long without killing the carrier, while others at the age of 18, they just lost 10 lead to that. Thank you. Looking forward to see if something comes up in the next few years. It's been extremely exciting, believe me. Because <laughs> if you leave and have stated in the last guideline, that if a pathologist reports to you in a biopsy diffuse gastric cancer with these biomarkers of aggressiveness that I mentioned, which should be taken as an indication for the surgeons to anticipate the gastrectomy. 
because they will be indicative of something that will go wrong. Matt? Hi, Fatima, how are you? Nice to see you. We have seen Rashid coping Rashid. <laughs> Fatima, follow, follow the Tiago's uh, question. Uh, what, what kind of attitude we can, can, be, can make to prevent gastric cancer in, in young ages? There's something you can follow, something you can, uh, you can detect prior of the aggressive uh, uh, phenotypes of the gastric cancer in, in young people. In carriers, you mean, Admar? Yeah. In carriers of the germline mutation. Um, yes? Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can know who the carriers are mm -hmm. earlier than the age recommended for prophylactic dystrophy. So mm -hmm. your question is, what are we going to do between, between the time you are aware and the time you remove the stomach? Yes, to avoid this dra dramatic cases. Of the, yeah, uh, yeah. The, there is not much to avoid those dramatic cases, as you say, and you have to be careful, yes. Mm -hmm. So during this period, in vitro, the carriage symptomatic should be submitted to endoscopy. Mm -hmm. This should be detected at least 30 minutes taking specimens from all parts of the stomach mm -hmm. and using the best endoscopic technologies to get the best vision. So this is one thing, is to look at and to be sure that you get a good sampling. Mm -hmm. Regarding prevention, nothing was proved as being the, well, the, the pill that will cure. Though there are many studies around mainly done in between New Zealand by the group of Perry Guilford. Sooner or later, maybe we'll learn more from what they are doing using organoids. And in these organoids, modulating the behavior. So I think we'll learn. In the meantime, of course, if the patient has H. pylori infection should be treated with antibiotics, should be recommended an LC diet, and the healthy life, but uh, paying attention to the symptoms, uh, keeping the endoscopy screening every six months, taking the biopsies, uh, removing H. pylori. You would ask now, but uh, is there any proof that H. pylori is also behind this hereditary? No proof. Okay. Most cases described in North America <clears throat> and even in Portugal are negative for H. pylori. Still. In mm. some environments, the bacterium is there. And if it makes arms in the sporadic context, why not in the hereditary? Okay. Better to treat than to wait and see. I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's all My the pleasure. My pleasure, Professor Silvio I'm sorry. All of a sudden, I moved to Portuguese. <laughs> My best greetings. Well, Christina, may I make a question to Professor Fatima? Yes, of course. Uh, Professor Fatima, uh, maybe this question goes a little bit out of the focus of your presentation, but uh, my question is on, on, on uh, the trends for yearly diagnosis of yearly le lesions. I mean, there's any news or novelties to do some, we know about the calculation of risk for specific cancer, and there are many data on that, but there's any possibility or new trends that you envision to do detection of yearly lesions other than endoscopy, that up to now, the yearly detection is based on endoscopy screening, uh, eventually biopsy. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah. no. may, I, may I try? Yeah. yeah. All of a sudden I was not listening to you. Now I'm looking at Hugo, just to say hello to him also. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. uh, trying to answer to your question. Uh, I'm afraid that for the moment, we do not have alternatives to endoscopy. But you are absolutely right. What we would like would have tracers of the lesions that you can use. If But there are people working on that. The problem is... Uh, uh, which biomarkers to use. 
and we have been discussing this in our research groups because one idea would, would be to use biomolecules in circulation with antibodies that would go to the places where the neoplastic cells are. The problem is that yep. these neoplastic cells, they do not express a new protein. They lose the normal protein. And this is one of the drawbacks. Yeah, but uh, and uh, my question is going a little bit, because when we think on blood, well, at least from my point of view, I can believe that blood is good to detect of recurrence of disease. But for early lesions, very early lesions. I anticipate that is going to the lumen. So my well, question I, was I'm going to detect something the on the gastric regression. Uh, I'm losing the connection, so I'm okay, I'm, uh, You say that for early lesions, you would like to have a now, biomarker it, that would predict those that will develop. That is the question? The question is, yearly biomarkers on the gastric secretion, on the lumen, detectable yeah. on the lumen, not on the blood, to detect okay, yearly lesions. The problem is the same. Uh, is the same as in the blood. And you are absolutely mm -hmm. right, because when people are looking for the biomarkers to target, <clears throat> they are looking for two purposes. One is to identify the presence for early diagnosed using gastric juice, and the other is to target the therapy. And both for the gastric juice or for the blood, the problem is the same. Is that for hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, there is not the novel expression of an aberrant protein at the surface. There is no aberrant biomarker. What we have is loss of the normal protein. So it has been impossible. All of us are thinking of what are we going to consider and uh, every day thinking of that, as you say, and sorry for having not got that immediately at the beginning, this would work in the gastric juice, would work more than that for during the endoscopies because we'll direct the endoscopies to the place where the cells are because I've not mentioned or emphasized when you look at the stomach in the symptomatic areas, the mucosa looks to be normal. It's very rare to have abnormal areas. And those abnormal areas, they are specifically targeted. For other individuals, the endoscopy can be completely normal. That's why you should take at least uh, more than 24 biopsies from normal mucosa during 30 minutes of an endoscopy. You know much better than me because you are a clinician how long it takes a normal endoscopy. So imagine the 30 minutes is to ob oblige people to look at everything. With computer assistance, using the artificial intelligence, trying not to lose those tiny lesions. But completely agree with you. The markers you are looking for would be helpful in the gastric juice. We would be helpful guiding the targets of the endoscopy and the biopsies, would be helpful for, for screening in the blood, but not there yeah. yet. Bioengineering okay. needs to play a role here. Nanotechnology, everybody is putting some effort in. I think we still have a lot to run. That, those are the good news. Okay. Um, there are no more, more questions, so um, I think we can finish now. Thank you very much, Professor Fatima, for your time and uh, your availability for our Ciencia Falada. Um, have a good week for all of you. See you next time. Thank you. Right. I, I will bye keep bye. on yes. talk with you. Yes. Okay. <laughs>